quickly begin today. So yesterday we saw what the renormalization group equation does to us, it does for us, and we also gave a proof of the renormalization group equation. So today we will just begin with some comments on our zero. This is all in the here how it is used normally. So the first comment I want to make is the following that I wrote this RG flow as something that tells us what happens to an amplitude when you scale all the momenta to lambda times the momentum. Right? It relates the amplitude at momentum lambda times ti to the amplitude at momentum. Right? But if you are calculating S matrix, then this strictly doesn't make sense except for massless part. And the reason is simple. Suppose you are doing S matrix. Then we have the relation that Ti square equal to minus M square. Right? If it has a acceleration of physical particle scattering. So now if you scale Ki, if you take each Ki and scale it up, you get lambda square Ki square, but this is of course minus lambda square Mi square, right? So this is not the correct relation because the mass is not scaled now, right? The mass is the same. Is that yeah? So given a set of particles, we cannot simply decide that we will consider another scattering amplitude where all the components of momentum and energy of the particle get scaled up by some lambda. Okay? That still that simply doesn't make sense because you don't satisfy the k square equal to minus m square relation. So there are two ways to think about this. One is that it can be applied directly for massless particles. Okay, if the external particles are massless, then of course there is a problem. But we may want to apply this to the particles which are mass. So for this, those intuitively we can see that if the momentum to begin with is very large, then they should behave as if they are massless. Right? The mass shouldn't matter. So it should be possible to at least approximately apply the renormalization group equation for given massive particles as long as the energies that are involved is very large. So let me try to make this more specific. So let's suppose that we have a relation of the form Ti square is equal to minus Mi square if we translate to Ti0 square equal to lambda square equal to Ki square Now, if we scale K to lambda K, suppose we scale Ki to lambda K, it has a spatial component of and see what happens to the zero point. Ti0 square will become Ti0 will become square root of lambda square Ti square plus Mi square, which I can write as lambda mod Ti plus Mi square over 2 lambda mod Ti plus higher order for large lambda. I just took the square root and expanded it in parts of 1 over lambda. Is this okay? Pardon? Yeah, so I'm not trying to scale 4 momentum right now. I'm saying let's suppose scale up, let's suppose we scale up the 3 momentum and let's see what happens to the fourth component. We don't want to, we cannot violate on shell condition for scattering matter. Yes, matter. Right? So you have to satisfy this. So you can only scale up three components of momentum. And let's see what happens to the fourth component. Okay, and what I'm saying is that the fourth component becomes lambda mod Ti plus Mi square over 2 lambda mod Ti. Okay, plus higher energy. So this term is small. Okay. So what this is allowing us to do is that it's not allowing us to relate Ki 
to the original momentum. But suppose we now consider two momenta, lambda 1 ti and lambda 2 ti, lambda 1 ti and lambda 2 ti. Okay, because lambda 1 and lambda 2 are both large. Then you see that the corresponding ti zeros will also be scaled by lambda 1 over lambda 2. Right? So when you go from this to this, you are scaling by lambda 1 over lambda 2. Right? With lambda 1 and lambda 2 both being large. Right? So lambda 1 is larger than lambda 2. So going from here to here by scaling by lambda 1 over lambda 2. But in that case, the ki zeros, for this ki zero, is approximately equal to lambda 1 mod ki 1 ki. And for this, it's equal to lambda 2 mod ki. Okay, approximately. So now you see that the ki zero also gets scaled by the same factor, lambda 1 over lambda 2. Yeah. So why the RG equation is not very useful for massive particles to relate large momentum to finite momentum? Right? Because if you start with finite momentum, then it's not you are not scaling all components simultaneously. Right? It just doesn't make sense because you are violating the k square equal to minus m square. But what you can do with RG equation is that you can relate two large momentum. Okay, you can go from lambda one ki to lambda two. You can even take lambda 1 to be much larger than lambda 2, right? but as long as lambda 2 ki is already much larger than the mass that you started with, then RG equation approximately tells you how to go between the two. Yes. Sir, what is the instead of ki, what is the invariant mass? The invariant mass you cannot scale, right? That's the point. See that invariant mass. The mass square, right? just then take the original mass square, right? That you cannot scale. The RG equation tells us that you have to scale up everything together. You want to scale K1 plus K2 whole square. Is that the yeah, you can scale K1 plus K2 whole square, but RG doesn't tell you what happens when we just scale K1 plus K2 whole square, right? Actually, the way we have derived the RG equation. The way we have derived the RG equation, you have to scale up all the energies. Right? And that can be done. As long as the energies are large compared to the mass of the particle. Okay, then it makes sense to scale up all components, not all energy, all components of momentum. Okay. You can scale up all components of momentum if to begin with the momentum components are larger than the mass. Is that point clear? Yeah. And this is okay because after all, in RG, okay, you are trying to determine the large lambda behavior okay, when the energies are all very large. Now we say that we can relate it to the behavior at lambda of order 1. But this of course is, well it is strictly true, okay, if you actually look at the RG equation, okay, if you really want to go to lambda of order 1, we have this equation d g bar lambda, d g lambda of g bar is beta of g bar, right? Because the equation of g alpha So if we really want to start from lambda of order 1, then g bar at 1 is gr, right, at a scale which is finite. There of course gr in general is large, there is no reason why gr should be small at finite energy. Right? Even in QCD, okay, at a finite energy, gr is, you have a, a strong coupling, right. The advantage of rg is that at large energies, the coupling constant becomes smaller. Okay. So the, at least in the, for asymptotically free theories, the true application of yeah. RG is that it relates the results at two different values of large energy. Okay, not that it can relate the value at large energy to a value at finite energy, because at finite energy things are very difficult to calculate. Okay. But it tells you how they how it depends on energy for large energy, okay, which is equivalent to saying that it relates the values of the amplitude for two large values of energy. And in that case, we can just ignore the mass because as you can see that once you have used this relation, the effect of the mass is suppressed by lambda. So, 
Yeah. 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 And at the same time, the fact that the coupling constant at lambda of order one is really not uh, small, right? So you cannot really evolve it all the way to lambda of order one. Right? But if you start already from a high energy where the coupling constant is small, then you can evolve it further for large energies. Is this clear? So you should think of RG at least for asymptotical field theory. The way we are applying RG, you should really think of this as determining the high energy behavior. Which is equivalent to saying that it's determining the relationship between the amplitudes at two high values of energies. One at lambda one pi, other one at lambda two pi. Is this point here? Yeah. Mi is a normalized mass. Or this is a physical mass. In fact, this is in general different from the normalized mass. Okay. It's a physical mass which tends to the location of the pole. That's a fixed object. Okay, that, yeah, exactly. Physical mass is a fixed object. So that's what this is. So you have to apply around 1 TV. Well, yes. So if you want to do, you can either apply it at 1 TV, which is, of course, uh, I mean, you can apply it, but you would like to apply it below 1 TV. Yeah. Okay? So what one can do is that you can work at an energy which is far below top chord mass. Okay? This is something I am going to discuss uh, later. And then you can assume as if the top chord is not there. Okay? Then you just ignore the effect of the top chord particularly. If it's so massive, right, then you shouldn't, I mean, you pretend as if you have never discovered the top chord, right? By working at an energy much below the top chord, which is still larger than the masses of the other quads. So that this approximation is valid, and the coupling is still sufficiently small. Right? As long as you go up to, to say start from 10 GeV, right, the coupling is already small in density. So you can uh, evolve the RG in that way. So if we improve the then Yeah, if you try to include the if the top chord effect is included in the beta function, right, that is applicable only at very high energy. So but in the yeah, okay, I'm going to come to that then in a few minutes, right? So uh, let's say that we pretend if you want to apply QCQ as a scalar energy scale below the top point, intuitively it's clear that you can pretend that the top point is not there, right? As if we have never discovered the top point, right? Or if you can, if you want to apply the RG at an energy much below above the top point, mass, then you pretend as if it's massless. Okay, but we will see in what sense we can work below the top quad mass. Right? That's something that we have not discussed. Right? What I have said so far, you have to include everything in a beta function. Right? We will see that there is a way to get around that. But intuitively it should be clear. Right? If you haven't even discovered a particle, if it's so heavy, then we shouldn't be able to, I mean, if the beta function really got contribution from everything, right? then by finding how the coupling changes at low energy, we should have discovered the top quad. But that's not the that's not how we can do, right? I mean, so obviously th there is some sense in which you can just that here we are at low energy, right? Should be as if the top part is, doesn't exist, right? Because you shouldn't be able to discover top part just by looking at the behavior at low energy. Okay, but we will see in what sense this is true. Okay, the second comment which I had mentioned earlier, but let me do it now, again, that remember that we have this relation f of lambda ki r is some exponential factor, which I am not going to write down, times f ki r bar, sorry, e bar, Okay, and let's assume that k is already sufficiently large so that this is 
this starts at already a small value. Okay, so that these problems are not there. But now you recall that if we calculate MR bar, sorry, M bar of lambda, we are not using R for the running couplings, the M bar of lambda, then its leading contribution is MR over lambda. Okay, this basically comes when solving the equation that d m bar d lambda and the leading contribution to this is minus m bar. You remember this? This comes from the minus d alpha m alpha, the canonical damage. Okay, for every coupling, d g bar alpha lambda d g bar alpha d lambda has a minus d alpha g alpha. Right? That's the first term. And then there are Beta function, the non border beta function. So the, this is the leading contribution to M bar running. And this tells us that M bar of lambda is M bar of lambda. Okay? So this is intuitively obvious that for large lambda, some of the effect of the mass should go away. Right? The theory should behave as if all the masses have been scaled to zero. Right? Even if there is no running of the coupling function, even if there is no renormalization. Just from dimensional analysis, if you are trying to behavior of the theory at high energy, that is equivalent to studying the behavior of the theory when all the other energy scales are becoming zero, keeping the energy scale of the external particles fixed. Right? That's what this is saying. That if you want to scale up the momentum by lambda, you could also equally well do it by scaling down all the other masses by appropriate parts of lambda, right? depending on the damage. And then there are corrections which are coming from the quantum effects, the beta function, the but because this is a dominant term, it's clear that for large lambda, MR bar is going to zero. So when we try to calculate this side, okay, even if we start from large k i, we see that the in the argument of this function, we have to set the renormalized masses to zero. Because we are supposed to evaluate this for M bar, right? MR replaced by M bar. Okay. And M bar at lambda is small. For large lambda. This part here. But I'm saying here, this is G bar, right? That includes in particular M bar. Okay, and that is small. This is okay provided the amplitude that comes here, the scattering amplitude for fixed external energies, external momenta, has a finite limit as M bar goes to zero. If the M bar goes to zero limit is divergent for some reason, then this formula is not very useful. Right? Because you have to now reanalyze what kind of divergence it has in the M bar goes to zero limit. Is that point here? Yeah. So you are trying to calculate this side, right? In terms of this side. Okay. So in the, if you want to calculate the large lambda behavior in terms of this, right, then effectively you are calculating it for small m bar. Right? This is just again simple dimensional analysis. Right? Now, you don't, now the ki is and non lethal is large. Well, fixed and large, say. Start, but not very large. Right? It's like ki is to be 10 g, where the couplings are already small, and it's large compa sufficiently large compared to the masses. Right? Proton mass is 1 gb, you have gone way above that. Right? But now, if you want to go to 1 TeV using this, right? then you are scaling lambda, that lambda is a large factor, right? which means effectively the M bar that has entered in this formula are scaling down. Okay? And that, in general, makes sense if this limit is finite. If M bar goes to zero limit, it's a finite result. Right? If there are additional divergences here, if the M bar goes to zero limit, then this formula is not very useful, right? Then you have to, then it doesn't tell you how, how to find the lambda dependence because effective mass is like one over lambda, right? And then you have to analyze what kind of divergence it has as m goes to zero, right? That will control some more uh, divergence as lambda goes to infinity. Is that point here? 
So these divergences, the divergences which come when you take the masses to zero, are what are called infrared divergences. So these are infrared divergences. This is coming. Why MR goes to zero? Because effectively, these things are we are replacing MR, MR by M bar, right? In the argument. Okay? On this side, it was MR, right? On this side, we are replacing M, MR by M bar of lambda. So, but, uh, the problem is only when uh, lambda is very large. Yes. It comes from lambda being large. Or yes, it comes from lambda being large, right? So these are not genuine infrared divergences. There may also have genuine infrared divergences, right? Yes. But that, those are not the ones that we are talking about here. These are coming because we are trying to relate the effect of large lambda to the effect of small m, effectively, right? Yes. So what this means is that there may be divergent terms like log of lambda over m, which are not truly divergent, right? For any finite lambda, it's a finite quantity, right? Log of lambda over m. But those divergences will be missed if you just can correct this factor, for example. Okay, we, yesterday we determined the lambda dependence by just looking at this factor and the factors of GR. Right? But without worrying about the fact that there will be additional lambda dependence that is coming from the MR goes to zero length. So if there are corrections of the form log lambda over MR over lambda, those corrections are not captured by what we have done so far. Because those those corrections, okay, those, the corrections are for log lambda over a what, or log m r over lambda. Those you can are finite quantities. Okay, those are not infinite. Any for any finite lambda, that's in, uh, finite. But those are there. If you try to evaluate it in this, in this way, right, on this side, of course, all the momenta are finite. Right, so you don't see that the lambda goes to infinity. Limit. The way you see it is as if the m r goes to zero limit has a divergence. The actual divergent term involves something like log of MR over lambda. Okay? You can either think of this as being divergent in the lambda goes to infinity limit or in the MR goes to zero limit. Is this point here? So in this way of, of on the left hand side, this would have been a divergence because lambda is being taken to infinity and there are factors like lambda over MR, log of lambda over MR. On this side, you see this divergence because MR is being said taken to zero, and there are factors like, or M bar is taken to be taken to be zero, and there are factors like log of lambda over M bar. Is this point here? Okay, so it's just two different ways of interpreting the same divergence. Okay. The divergence that we are worried about is the divergence that involves the ratio MR over lambda. Those divergences cannot be captured by the RG. Okay, because those divergences are also remaining on this side. Because we are supposed to replace MR by MR over lambda, which is M bar. Okay. And in the MR goes to zero limit, it's the divergence. Okay. So for this reason, when we try to apply RG, at least at high RG, we look for what are called infrared safe quantities. So the strategy is to apply RG. IR safe means okay, that this has finite limit when the masses go to zero. Okay, in any quantum field theory, 
there will be some quantities which are not IR set. Right? They are perfectly fine quantities. It's just that they are they diverge as masses go to zero. Okay, as long as you don't take the masses to zero, they are perfectly fine. But there are other quantities which actually don't diverge as masses go to zero. So those are the ones that you can analyze effectively using RG in this sense. Okay, in the way we have done so far. So I'll give some examples. And I should also say that most of the applications, at least in particle physics, of this kind of RG equation is for QCD. Okay, because as far as the uh, weak interaction, electromagnetic interaction are concerned, their coupling is already small. Okay, so you don't really worry about RG, which is one higher order. Okay, you just work with lowest order. Okay, for most calculations, you work with lowest order in the coupling constant. But QCD is a problem because at finite energy, at 1 GeV, for example, QCD coupling is very strong. Okay. So there, if you want to apply RG, and if you try to use the coupling constant that is measured at 1 GeV, okay. then without RG, that analysis is very complicated. Okay. If you go to high energy, okay, you don't have to use RG, right? as long as you uh, sum of sufficient number of diagrams. If you go to high energy, right, what will happen is that if you try to use the original coupling, measure at 1 GeV, each term in the perturbation expansion will be large, and then you have to somehow resum them to get a small result. But if you apply RG, then using this, scattering at high energy, you can relate to a new scattering amplitude at smaller energy but with smaller coupling. That's what this is saying. And so you can reorganize the analysis. And as I said, because QCD coupling is large, it is a very effective procedure for QCD. Okay, so this analysis, these examples that I'll be describing is in the context of QCD. Okay, but the general philosophy remains the same in all theories that if you want to apply RG to study high energy behavior, then you have to look for infrared safe quantities. If you don't look at infrared safe quantities, then you have to separately understand what happens to this side when the masses are going to see what kind of divergences there are, and take them into account. Okay, so example, E plus E minus total process. E plus E minus 120. Yeah, and I'll explain what one means by this. So this is anything, it means basically that all strong interacting particles, all hydrogen. So let me explain this in a little more detail. So suppose you have E plus E minus. So the leading contribution, E plus E minus going to some hadrons, okay, or some few strongly interacting particles, we start with Q cube over here, is this one. This is a photon. Yeah. Okay, photon couples to both E plus E minus as well as quartz. Okay, so you calculate this. So this is the lowest order diagram that is possible in QED. Okay, of course you can use Z boson, okay, which will be a little weaker because of the mass of the Z. So let's just focus on this. And now what you are trying to do is to work to lowest order in quantum electrodynamics. You don't want to put any more or some fine scattering constant, okay. the E, because that will be too small. But you want to include all possible corrections here, which involve strong interaction. Okay. So if you want E plus E minus on the Q, Q bar, you will run 
for gluons. This is a gluon. Okay. If you want to do, for example, e plus e minus one to q q bar gluon, then you will improve this diagram. Now it turns out that all of these amplitudes, the type cross section, are actually infradimensional. Individually, e plus e minus one q q bar amplitude, this has infradimensions. This diagram on the type cross section has infradimensions. Due to the mass is going to zero. In fact, some they are part of the some of the infradivergence comes just because the gluon is massless. Okay, which is there even without, without the taking the zero mass limit. There are some other infrared divergence which, co which come in the limit of the mass of the quad goes to zero. It's an additional infrared divergence. So none of these diagrams by themselves can be analyzed using RC. Okay, because you have to understand what happens in the limit when M2 goes to zero, for example. Okay, and that's divergent in general. So you have maybe extra parts of a log that. But suppose you want to ask this question that e plus e minus going to anything, which means that you sum over all such processes. Okay? Not as an amplitude, of course, in amplitude it doesn't make sense to add up two different amplitudes, right? But you calculate the cross section of e plus e minus going to q q bar okay, by squaring this. Add to that the cross section for e plus e minus going to q q bar gluon. Okay? e plus e minus going to q q bar arbitrary number of gluons, okay? many and more q q bar p adds and so on. Once you add up all these contributions, that expression is infrared set. This is clear. So individually, these diagrams are all infrared divergent, but in the sum, they are infrared divergence are cancelled. Does this statement uh, make sense? Okay, in the sum, the infrared divergence are cancelled. So then suppose you have to calculate e plus e minus going to anything. How will you calculate it? What is the diagram that you have to calculate? Now you are applying RC. e plus e minus going to anything. Okay. Two parts of this QVD vortex you have to use. For QVD vortex, you are not trying to apply RC. Okay. We are trying to apply RG on the QCD vortex. Okay. So e plus e minus going to anything, how will you calculate? based on what I have told you so far. Uh, yes. Just, I mean, so just taking the, this e plus e minus going to q q bar without this glue on line, just the first diagram. Yeah. So we will calculate this in the high energy limit, means high lambda value. Mm -hmm. So that, that uh, in that way we calculate the left hand side of the RG equation. Right. Then, uh, well, left, you don't want to calculate the left hand side directly. You want to calculate the right hand side. Right? Yeah. Okay, then the I right have to. Right. Okay. Take the energy. So, we want to have the energies large, right? Yes. But right hand side has higher energy, right? Okay. Maybe 10 GV. Okay? It's somewhat large, but not very large. Mm -hmm. So, and then what to do on the right hand side? I'm asking what calculation on the right hand side you will do to get the left hand side, which is e plus e minus 1 to anything at very high energy. You are saying the right hand side involves e plus e minus going to anything, mm -hmm. okay, but calculated at a value of the coupling, which is g bar. Okay, QCD coupling has gone to g bar, and g bar is small. Okay, because you have taken lambda to be large. Okay. So what diagram will you have to calculate? Only the first one. Only the first one. Without this. So you just calculate this. Q, Q bar. Of course, there are many Q and many Q bars. So you have to sum over those. You will take a mod square of this, sum over all possible q, q bar, all q, q bar here. You are including this because this is higher order in QCD, right? On the right hand side, you will be evaluating it as g bar. Right? So these contributions, when you use g bar, they will be order g bar squared subplace. 
So just calculate this, and that gives you the Q cube or e plus e minus one for anything class. Even though we never produce actually quark in final state. In QCD, quarks are not part of the final state, right? Because by con because of the confinement, what you produce in QCD are only protons and neutrons and uh, color neutral particles. Nevertheless, because of this RG argument, it tells us, and because of the fact that this process is infrared safe, it tells us that if we just calculate this, e plus e minus 1 to q cube, or take mod square, sum over all possible q cube are final state, the answer that you get is would be identical okay, in the large and ener high energy limit to the total cross section for producing anything in the final state. Why we are not considering the external state the blue one line? I mean, in that uh, Q, with the Q Q one also. Because, of course, that, that you have to next order you have to calculate that this one, right? But this has a GC, uh, strong interaction coupling, right? G bar. So if you want to calculate coupling or correction of next order, right? <coughs> this is separated by G bar square, right? And G bar as you saw has a one over log lambda, right? So because of that, you don't, I mean, the leading order conclusion comes from here, right? So next, if you want to go to next order, see, this also tells you how to systematically go to next order, right? You have to include this, but you have to also include all possible other diagrams at this order. Because that's what is supposed to be in price set, right? If we just try to calculate this diagram, or the effect of this correction to keep you on PR production, right? Individually, these are infrared diagrams. But to any given order, okay, for the, some of the total contribution, e plus e minus 1 to anything, that is supposed to be infrared safe. So that you can calculate. Okay. So if you want to go to one higher order, you have to include all possible diagrams to the next order and calculate the contribution. Okay. But with the strong interaction coupling, replaced by G1. Okay. Well, it's, it, it, there is a way of code, but it's not easy. Right? You have to well, do some work to show that it's IR safe. Right? So which, which point it is IR safe, right? I mean, this, this, this basically requires a lot of effort to return it in the initial days of quantum phase okay? Typical experience is that if you sum over final states, and sometimes you may also have to average over initial states, then things become IR, IR safe. Okay, I'll discuss one more example of higher safe point. So this analysis, in fact, is one of the ways that you can try to determine the number of colors. Okay, now, suppose you didn't know what the strong interaction group is. Okay, we know I said it's SU3, right? But of course, you don't see individual colors, right? Quarks and uh, individual quarks are never discovered, right? You only discover the color neutral part. But this diagram, right, here of course you are taking the quartz as final state, right? The number of colors will determine how many diagrams there are, right? Because for every color, you have one pair, right? You have Q1, Q2 up to Qn, right? Then you have a Q1, Q1 bar pair, Q2, Q2 bar pair, Q3, Q2 bar pair, so and you have to sum over all of them. Okay? So the total cross section of E plus E minus going to anything, okay? Anything means anything hydraulic will be determined, will be sensitive to how many colors you have. What is the gauge? Uh, how many, uh, yeah, how many color quantum number the quark carries. So when you compare this, say with E plus E minus go to mu plus mu minus. Then the more color there is, the more will be the cross section for decaying into final state hydrons, right? As compared to mu plus mu minus. Because as you are changing the number of colors, the mu plus mu minus, of course, doesn't change, right? There's only one mu plus mu minus square. So using this as an experimental input, you can determine, for example, how many colors there are in the for the quartz. Even though the colors are not directly observable. Okay. So this is yes, but what, how do you know the number of generators? Right? SUN. So here the color I'm talking about N of SUN. But this calculation is sensitive to the charges that the quartz carries and how many 
words that are right in each generation so for even if you take the up and down right up comes in three varieties that tree is not observed in any direct experiment but it can be observed in this indirect experiment by calculating total cross section of e plus e minus one everything. So another example where it was, it was first applied in this example, okay, infinite set quantity, D is what is called deep inelastic time. So here basically what one does is the following. experiment is that we take an E coming in, going to a neutrino by the exchange of a W. Okay, we can figure out what charge W carries. And then, so basically the scattering, W of course in intermediate state, scattering, scattering is that you take an E and a P, collide them, okay, just throw an electro electron on the, on the target which has protons. And then observe the process where you produce one final set neutrino, okay, which basically means that you produce nothing because neutrinos are hard to observe, and something. Okay, E hits a proton. You look at the case where it produces an electron, okay, which is basically detected by saying that some energy will be missing, right? That energy balance will be uh, not satisfied. That that will not tell us that something is being something is carrying away the extra energy, okay, which is a neutrino and some other part. Now it turns out that if you consider the process where you sum over all possible final state, again we had okay, one neutrino and all possible final state, you don't, you don't care whether it's pions or protons or uh, other hadrons that are produced in the final state, then this process is again infrared set. Ep going to neutrino plus anything. And for this process again we can apply Rg, okay, when the external energy, when the relative energy is large, which means this momentum is Q, in the limit when Q becomes large, limit, this can be studied using Rg. Okay, I will not describe how it is done in detail, but this was This historical, in fact, this is the first place, okay, this experiment, which gave the indication that uh, strong interaction is asymptotically free. Okay. That when people actually did the scattering, okay, they found as if the electron is scattering from some free particles inside the proton. Okay. Which was a surprise because normally you would have expected that if the strong interaction is strong, then when the electron hits it, that there will be very complicated interaction. Right? It shouldn't look like it's scattering from a set of free particles inside the proton. So the fact that it was behaving as if it's scattering from free particles inside the proton gave the indication that the, the interaction that describe the strong force is an asymptotically free interaction. Even though it looks strong at low energies, okay, at high energy it's becoming weak. Okay, and as I said, this process you can prove is infrared here. Okay, and hence you can actually use Rg to calculate what happens as a result of this process. But it's a little more complicated than that one. Okay, where you just have to calculate the simple diagram. So it's really important.
So again, relating it to low energy basically means that you relate two high energy uh, results, right? Yeah. Say one at 100 GV, one at 10 GV. Yes, you can do it for weak interactions also. It's the other way, weak interaction, the coupling constant itself is so small that RG is not very uh, effective. That you can certainly do it. If you, uh, if you work at say energies, which are above the weak interaction scale, right? Quite effective with the W boson masses are small. Say one TeV versus 100 TeV. Right? You can certainly use RG to relate the result at 100 TeV to the result at 1 TeV. Yes. So in principle, there is nothing which makes QCD special, except that QCD, because the coupling at low energy is uh, strong, right? this is more the most effective in QCD. Right? Without this, in fact, you couldn't predict anything in QCD, right? Because part of theory, only tells you how to deal with quarks and gluons, right? There's no description of protons and uh, neutrons and pions in part of theory, right? So how do you calculate anything in QCD, right? The reason that you can calculate anything in QCD is precisely because of this fact there are certain infrared safe quantities, okay, where you know that even though you cannot directly deal with protons and neutrons, okay, the coupling constant, the effective coupling is becoming small, okay? So you just calculate lowest order process with quarks. Don't worry about protons and neutrons. Because of the asymptotic freedom, right? Because in the uh, when the coupling is weak, then the quarks are good descriptions. Right? So you calculate the calculate and scattering involving quarks, and that tells you what the result is when the actual final states are protons and neutrons and other quarks. Is this clear? Yeah. Okay. So the third comment that I want to make about RG is about composite operators. So the renormalization group equation that we wrote down was for this, right? Or we call this I R I S. So these are the fundamental fields of But you could imagine that we want to find RG equation for this, where Ys are complicated operators. For example, in QED, you can consider psi bar gamma mu psi. as some of what. You want to calculate correlation functions involving psi by gamma mu psi. Or you want to calculate correlation functions of if you do f Now Naively, one would think that as long as you know how to calculate correlation functions involving sides and psi bars, this you can get just by taking the limits, right? Calculate psi bar x, psi y, that you know how to calculate from this. And then take the limit x goes to y. The problem is that that limit is divergent, right? Even though we have made the correlation functions of product of size and psi bars and amus finite by renormalization. So you now take two points and take them close to each other, right? you have additional divergences. Okay? Whenever two operators come close to each other, there are additional divergences. And you need additional renormalization. Okay? So the fact that you have made the operators that these fields have renormalized so that these correlation functions are finite does not immediately guarantee that correlation functions of these kinds are also finite. this point here. Okay, so let me give an example. Okay, with this high bar gamma mu side. Yeah, this is similarly related to normal ordering, but we'll just think of it in a slightly different way. 
But yes, like, this is real fit from our order. So nobody really interacts with QRE. So suppose we are trying to calculate this psi 1 gamma mu psi of x, psi of y, psi bar of x. You can take a Fourier transform p to the i p1 dot x1 to p1 dot x p1 dot x p2 dot y p2 dot y p2 dot y p2 dot z and then this correlation function. So diagrammatically, what is it that you are trying to calculate? We have a composite operator. This is psi bar psi composite operator. The momentum that is here is p1. Then you have a psi of y, this has momentum p2, and then you have psi bar, which has momentum p3. So these are the three I have just drawn, these three sources. And then the Feynman rule tells us that you have to basically connect them in all possible ways and draw the diagrams. Okay? To calculate this correlation function, you just connect them in all possible ways and uh, find what it is, what you get. Is this clear? So one diagram, of course, is this one. This is the lowest order diagram. But now there are corrections. So consider this correction over here. This loop integral is divergent. Is that clear? If this is L, then this will be hot. P2 plus L. P2 plus L. This will be p minus l so you have l square in the denominator from here okay. l in the denominator from here so that is the formula is propagated and l in the denominator from here so four parts of n in the denominator four integration so this is divergent okay. since you are telling here i at divergent pardon no not i at divergent Large L, large L, right? Large L is divergent, right? And you can also see that this divergence is something new that was not there when the points x and the, the size. If you think of the psi bar psi as two different points, this diagram, this divergence was not there, right? Suppose it was, you split it, right? Suppose you make it psi bar x1 psi x2. Okay. Then it's like four points, right? Then the same diagram would be this. Okay, this these two points would have been split. This diagram has doesn't have any divergence, right? This is this is divergence from loop integral. This of course doesn't have the divergence. So there are divergences which come for composite operators which are not there when the operators are not composite, right? When they are split. Is this clear? So when you calculate matrix elements, when you calculate correlation functions of these kind, you get additional divergences which wouldn't have been there if you had to calculate psi bar psi at separate points, psi 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 bar at separate points. Is this 
So now if you want to calculate correlation functions like this, what you have to say is that the physical operators are not this, but this times a constant which compensates for this error. So you have to define O or this Ys we say that y of x is actually some let's call it red hat ij ojr of x okay. so these are some linear combinations these are the original operators okay like this okay whose matrix elements have these additional divergences but we take this y's to be linear combinations of some renormalized operators and the idea is that we will adjust these z hats to make the correlation functions of the ORs finite. Okay, even though the correlation functions of the OIs are infinite. Is this point clear? So let me repeat again. Okay. So this is divergent, right? That I hope everybody agrees, right? This is divergent, and there is no counter term which removes this divergence, right? Because this divergence came afresh, right? It was not there in the original theory, right? Original theory, we had added counter terms for every vortex of a theory, right? And every propagator. But this operator was not there, right? This is a new operator that you are trying to calculate, whose matrix element now, okay? So you need new renormalized constants. Okay. This is different from yeah, this is that different from the z. That, that's why I call it z hat. Okay. So okay. these are dependent on the operators that we are considering. In particular formulation, how do we get this? Uh, how do we get this? Mean function, mean function. In particular, we uh, yes. take the derivative with respect to j. So yeah, yeah. So the point is, in the path formulation, you can of course calculate this because you need introduce sources for these, right? That's why you do this, or you just say that this is like the x goes to y limit of psi bar x psi y. Okay? But in the limit, when you take x goes to y, you get additional divergences, okay? which you have to remove. Is this point here? Okay. So if we have correlation functions of this kind, or say product over i, O tilde i pi. You can derive similar RG equation for these. Okay. Except that now you will get new anomalous dimensions which come from derivatives of these. Right? Earlier, when you had the psi i's, right, or the phi i's, right, there are anomalous dimensions of the phi i's, right, which came from how the phi i's have to be renormalized. Okay. Now there will be anomalous dimensions for this composite operator. Yeah, for example, for this psi bar gamma mu psi, right, there will be renormalization. Okay, so let's consider multiplicative renormalization. Okay. So you'll get some psi bar gamma mu psi. Okay, let's for simplicity assume that we don't have any mixing. So we'll write this as z hat times psi bar gamma mu psi, let's say OR. Okay. This is a renormalized version of psi bar gamma mu psi. Okay. So given z hat, Right, we can calculate the corresponding RG equation, and you'll get a new gamma hat, okay, which comes from the derivative of Z hat. Okay, that's it, it, the procedure is exactly identical to what we did for ordinary fields. Okay, but the important point, point to remember is this, this Z hat is not just the product of Z for psi and Z for psi one. Okay, because of the compositeness, because of the these are at the same point, there are additional divergences, right, which we have to remove because of this. So, is there any relation between these jets and the fields? I mean, uh, one can think of that yeah. these two points can be related by another photon line. Suppose means any number of can be there. So, yes. by summing those divergences, can one get this jet hat? Is there any relation? In general, no. See, here you can say, okay, this is also this kind of diagram also arose in renormalizing elementary vortices. Right? Mm -hmm. 
because Sai Baba Gangnam Sai was part of the elementary part, right? So these diagrams are not completely new. But I could consider operators which did appear in the original Lagrangian atom. Right? I could have put it in gamma phi. Right? I mean, just for yeah. simplicity. Suppose our operator is high bar gamma phi, gamma phi gamma phi, right? Okay. Then this that this vortex, this is not even part of the original vortex. Right? So the diagram that will calculate this will be gamma phi gamma phi. Okay. So this is, this is generally new operator which was not not there in the, in the original vortex. So in general, the composite operators have their own renormalization constant, right, which are not related to any renormalization constant that you had encountered in renormalizing the theory. Right? For operators, you need additional renormalization. Sir, in renormalization theory, yes. we had uh, counter terms in action. Yes. So here, uh, we had counter terms in action, right? But what is the physical interpretation of those counter terms? That the couplings that you had introduced in the action are not physical. You would rewrite them in terms of some uh, uh, renormalized coupling, right? And the relationship between the uh, 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 weird couplings, which are in the action, and the renormalized couplings can have infinities. Then the fields that we had introduced in the action are not, their correlation functions are not finite. Right? Those are related to renormalized fields by some multiplicative factor. Similarly here, okay, after you have done all that, we now introduce this upper y of x. Now, who told you that y of x is something uh, which will have a finite matrix element? Right? Some operator will have a finite matrix element, right? but this did not be related to y of x by uh, finite multiplication. Right? And that's what is happening here that y of x is related to the physically observable operators by another set of in infinite renormalization, and those are encoded in set. So, this has nothing to do with the action. No, this has nothing to do with the action. Uh, independent of uh, exactly. These are the ones. This is these, these are telling us which operators are the ones whose matrix elements give finite result. For each operator, we use uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. right. Now you may want ask why do you want to do this? Because after all, from the action, if we can find the S matrix, right, you don't need these composite operators. Right. But often it turns out that it's useful these composite operators. Right. When, for example, if you have a Q, suppose you are uh, QCD is strongly interactive, right? And you have to calculate the matrix element of like this one, for example. I told you this process, right? E plus E plus E minus going to QQ1. Okay. One formal way of calculating this is by saying that you forget about the Q and QED part altogether. Okay. And you look at the current that is appearing in this part, which is psi q bar gamma mu 2, right? And then you can reformulate the whole analysis in terms of matrix elements of q bar gamma mu 2. So as far as the QED, so as far as the QCD part is concerned, right? What you're calculating is the matrix element of q bar gamma mu q with anything, right? The fact that e plus and e minus are, e minus are there is actually irrelevant for this part of the calculus. Right, for QVD part of the calculation. Okay. So this will be an example of a comp composite operator. Okay. The Q bar gamma mu Q that you have to introduce to describe the coupling to the photon. Okay. Photon is not part of QCD. Okay. It's of course part of the standard model. But if you want to think of the calculation purely in terms of QV, uh, QCD, you think of this as a calculation involving a composite operator. But in this case, of course, if you include also the photon, right, then renormalization of this vortex is part of the uh, renormalization of the theory, right? Because this is one of the vortex of the theory, right? One of the interaction vortex. But as far as QCD is concerned, this is not an interaction vortex, right? This is telling us how the photon couples the vortex. Right? If you try to formulate the theory purely in terms of QCD, right? then you think of this as, as if you are calculating the matrix element of a composite operator. And in that case, you have to renormalize the composite operator. Because then there will be no vertex in the action which has a photon and a Yeah, because QCD, of course, doesn't have the photon, right? So as far as QCD is concerned, then this is an external object, right? And you reformulate the calculation as if you are calculating the matrix element of this phi bar, uh, Q bar, uh, gamma mu uh, Q operator. Is this, yeah? 
and the similar thing is true for the sleep analysis scattering that I described, right? There again, it's effectively you are calculating the matrix element of some operator which describes the coupling of the W to the uh, strongly interacting fields. But if you don't want to include also the W boson as part of your system, right? Then again, you think of this as a composite operator in QC, right? Which gives you the current that the W couples to. Is this okay? So that's why composite operators are sometimes useful. Right? That if you remove part of the theory, right, which is trivial, then you can reformulate the calculation as if you are calculating matrix elements of composite operators. Matrix element that should be that. Particular. Oh, in general, the operators will mix. Okay. That in order to renormalize one operator, right, you may need to add counter terms for many different operators. Okay. For example, okay, here and this is probably not a good example. Let's see. Let's consider phi four theory. Okay. Suppose you have five four theory. And you want to renormalize phi to the eight point. Okay, phi to the eight vortex means some vortex from which eight lines are coming out. So these are very different kinds of divergence. One is this kind of divergence. You can add, this is a allowed interaction in phi 4 theory, right? So here, you still have eight external lines, okay? So this divergence has to be removed by counter term, which is some constant as phi to the eight. But this also has other kinds of divergence. Consider a diagram like this. Okay, you can easily check that this is a divergent. If you do the loop counting, okay, this part of the di diagram is divergent. Okay. But what counter term will you add to remove this? Okay. See, now there are six external lines, right? So this operator, this kind of divergence has to be renormalized by adding an operator which is phi to the six. So to renormalize the phi to the eight uh, uh, vortex, you have to actually also add a part which is phi to the six. Right? That's why this is in general a matrix. That when you want to add this counter term, that to renormalize a given operator, you may have to add other operators in the process. Is this? So this is just reflecting that a given operator that cannot be renormalized just by that operator in general. So now we have an interval theory of psychosis. Yes. Can we you have we don't have the same example here? Does it does it have one minus V or so even in that theory, I mean allowed for a general mixing, right? In a general theory, right? The a given coupling can be renormalized yeah. with mixing yeah. with other things, right? So when a given field can also be uh, required be, um, uh, to be renormalized by mixing with other fields, right? Unless there is a symmetry, right? Sometimes what happens is there is a symmetry, right? Which allows you to not mix. For example, in, in CVD example that we described, right? If there is a gamma mu here, right? you can check that you don't need to add a counter term which is, say, psi bar psi. Yeah, because there is a symmetry which prevents it. Right? This is Lorentz vector. Right? So to renormalize it, you don't need to, need to add a counter term which is a Lorentz scalar. Okay. So 
So sometimes the symmetry uh, protects you, but other than that, if there is no symmetry that prevents mixing of this kind, okay, to renormalize a given operator, you have to add counter terms which also involves other operators in them. Is this point here? So which means that in the in the phi to the eight theory, right? That the phi to the eight by itself doesn't give you finite results, right? To get a finite result, you have to take the phi to the eight vortex and then also add this vortex with some uh, infinite constant, okay, which will cancel off these divergences. Okay, and only then you can get expect to get a finite result, right? And that's that's what is reflected by this hat hat. Okay, that renormalizing a given operator requires adding other operators which are not on the same kind. And you can say that phi to add to the alpha, also add phi fold. Yes, you have to add phi fold also in this case. Right? Because there are many other diagrams you can. We already have phi fold, that's the difference. Yeah, that's the part because phi fold, that was part of the renormalizing interaction model, right? Now you are asking about renormalizing a composite operator. Phi two to phi eight, all in general, yes. Yeah, in general, you have to add all possible operators. Yes, you are asking. I'm saying that uh, the infinite square can be prepared as complete uh, finite. You can separate that thing. Okay. In general, that cannot be. Uh, well, the point is, when you try to talk about the matrix element of phi to the eight, right? What happens is that the phi to the eight itself doesn't give a non-zero matrix element. Right? But phi to the eight times some constant c times phi to the six plus b times phi to the four, etc. And then there will be also terms like del mu phi, del mu phi, phi squared, various kinds of operators. Okay, you have to add with various coefficients. Okay. And only after add, these are all infinite coefficients that you are normally normalizing by. And this combined, combined operator has finite matrix element. Okay. That this gives you divergent because of this diagram, okay. but then you cancel it by, there is also a times phi to the 8, okay. you cancel that divergence, this divergence by adjusting a, you cancel this divergence by adjusting c, okay. because this can be cancelled by 6 point vortex, and so on. Okay. So this is the reason why in general there is mixing between the operators. Okay. Normalizing a given operator requires that you add various other operators also. Final point I want to discuss is applying RG for small lambda. Okay, so far we have been discussing RG for large lambda, and that's why most of the applications in higher energy physics have been. But you can also ask what happens to RG as lambda goes to zero. Okay. What is the behavior at low energy? And so here, let's assume that the external states are massless, okay, or at least when you take lambda goes to zero, the extra ma the, 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 you know, by the same argument that I gave, right, unless the momenta are large compared to the masses, it doesn't make sense to take all components of momentum to zero, right? So we'll assume that the states which you have, who, whose scattering you are calculating right, are either massless or have very small mass, so that you still talk about, for, even for uh, small lambda, Lambda ki is still large compared to the masses of the particles. Okay. And here also we have considered, uh, we will consider asymptotically free theory? No, not asymptotically free theory, in general. Okay. Just consider, suppose you are studying the lambda goes to zero, right? This it simplifies only in the theory of the infrared free, right? If the coupling constant becomes small or constant as lambda goes to zero. But one of the problems here, well, not of all of the problems. Let me write the relation again. So you have f lambda ki gr is f d 
gi and gr bar, right? g bar. The mass is now go to infinity because mr by lambda this now goes to infinity. <coughs> this need not be masses of the external particles, okay? Masses of some internal particles which are propagating in the loop. Okay, those are of course parameters of the theory. Okay, even though the external particles, we are assuming that the masses are small. Okay, but they are internal particles which are propagating in the loop and whose appears here in this complex. There's an exponential. Yes, there is an exponential, yeah, which you are not worried about. <laughs> So the question is, how do we handle the situations of this kind? Okay, that now we have the opposite problem that we have parameters which are becoming large. Right? If you want to evaluate it by evaluating this, okay, there are parameters which are becoming large. Okay, the masses are becoming large. Now intuitively, it should be clear what one should do. Because if the masses are becoming large, then somehow we should be able to think as if they are not there, right? Because the large mass particles, we shouldn't be able to, shouldn't affect theories at low energy, right? I mean, after all, we know the, I mean, we have calculated, we have done experiments up to the few uh, TV scale, right? But there can be mass, uh, particles, say, 10 to the 10 TV, right? They are not going to affect, even if they are there, they shouldn't affect the physics that we see today. So in some sense, one intuitively feels that when the masses are becoming large here, we should be able to just ignore them, these particles. Okay? But there are two apparent contradicting factors. Suppose we ignore these particles. Then when you calculate a beta function, these particles shouldn't have been there. Right? One loop beta function. But we wrote down the expression for the on-loop beta function, right? For some case. Masses didn't enter the expression for the on-loop beta function. If you look at the running of the coupling constant, right? There's no mass in that, right? But the number of particles that occurs right? in the quark loops, in the, in the fermion loop. Oh, it occurs. Yeah. But even if the quark mass goes to infinity, yeah. it will still contribute if we take that formula. Okay. Because the formula doesn't depend on the mass, right? Yeah, that is not depend on the mass, only depend on the number. Only number. depend on the number, right? So this is yeah. somewhat counterintuitive, but this is something I've derived, right? That uh, yeah. the mass didn't enter the expression of the beta function, right? So if the mass is infinite, then the propagator will Mass is not infinity, 10 to the 10 TV, right? But the way we have defined the beta function, right? We use dimensional regularization. You would see that the mass don't appear. So that's one issue. Even though intuitively we feel that mass should appear somehow, or even if, I mean that particle shouldn't be there, right? It shouldn't contribute to the beta function because we wouldn't even know the existence of that particle if it's a very heavy, heavy particle, right? So this is the first somewhat of a contradiction. The second problem that comes is that typically if we look at the actual expressions for not the beta function but the amplitudes, okay? in the amplitude, if there is a heavy particle propagating in the loop. It's not the answer is that it doesn't contribute. Okay. In fact, it contributes with things like log of m over mu. Okay, if we act, when you actually do a one loop calculation, right? If there is a heavy particle propagating in the loop, you will find contributions in the loop which are the form log of m over mu, which involves log m over mu. And because m will be displaced by m bar, right? In this case, log of m bar by mu. Mu is kept fixed. That's why I have not even written mu here. M bar is becoming large as lambda goes to zero. So this is large in general. Right? So this can give large contribution, even if this is a very, very heavy particle. Now it turns out that these two facts are related. That the 
fact that beta function is not seeing the contribution from the, the fact that the particle is becoming heavy okay, and the fact that you are getting this large contribution, okay, these two actually compensate each other. Okay, and if we don't take into account the fact that these two compensate each other, okay, we'll, I mean, effectively we will have two large contributions which will eventually cancel, but it's very hard to see that cancellation by doing this kind of thing. So the way one proceeds here okay, is to say that when the energy scale, right? Suppose you are using your, your RG evolution okay, towards small lambda. Okay, at some value of lambda, the lambda ki, this order of the momenta, becomes equal to the mass of the particle, mass of some particle. When lambda goes below, the energy scale comes below the mass of the particle. If you continue to evolve the same RG equation, same uh, RG, then you will start getting large contributions of this kind. Okay? You will not take into account the fact that the beta function running has changed because the beta function doesn't see that mass. Okay? And at the same time, you will start getting large contributions of the form of log m over b, right? or log m bar over b, once m bar becomes smaller than u, okay? or smaller than lambda here. So what you do? is that once lambda becomes sufficiently small so that the energy scale, the lambda ki has come below the threshold of mass of that particle, okay, you effectively change the description of the theory. Okay. You use the fact that when lambda ki, when the actual energies are small compared to the mass of the particle, okay, you can effectively ignore the effect of the, uh, the mass of the particle. Okay. This is what is sometimes called integrating out the particle, a heavy particle. You pretend as if the theory doesn't have that particle. Okay. But the price you pay is that the coupling constants okay, change a little. Okay, coupling constants without the particle and with, with that particle, if you have if you want effectively the same theory, okay, then the coupling constant that you have to use for without the particle and with this particle are different. Okay. And this is the reason why, I mean you can see why, right? Because if you didn't integrate out that particle, it will contribute to uh, continue to contribute to, to the beta function and the coupling function will continue to run, including the contribution from that particle. Okay. So obviously the particle, the coupling constant that you would get, effective coupling that you would get after you have removed that particle is different from the one that you would get if you haven't uh, removed that particle. Okay. So this is sometimes called a threshold correction. Okay. That once the lambda comes below the threshold of production of a given particle, what you do is that you change the description of the theory. Okay. You start running your RG equation in a different way. Okay. Instead of using the original beta function, okay. you read some value, say lambda equal to lambda naught, okay. such that lambda naught ki okay. is smaller than the mass of the heavy particle, the mass of the particle, mass two, say m physical. Okay. Then you go to a new theory where you remove this, part, this particle altogether. So new theory doesn't have this particle. Okay. But new theory has the coupling constant, the G that you start with is not the G bar, but corrected G bar, okay, which is what is called the threshold correction. That you don't use the same G bar, okay, but G bar gets changed, or the initial condition that we will use for G bar gets slightly changed from where you have reached here at lambda naught. Okay, so the new G, the new <coughs> GR is G bar R of lambda naught, the original GR, plus some correction, okay, which are special. And then you start evolving G bar, now the new beta function. Right, which doesn't have that particle. Okay. So this is the way one normally uh, one evolves the RG equation when you want to go to lower lambda. Okay. Namely that every time you cross a threshold of producing a certain particle, every time the energy scale comes below the mass of certain particle, okay, you modify your mm. couplings a little bit okay, and throw out that particle from your theory. Okay, and then you use a new beta function to evolve the coupling constant further down. 
Okay, so this is the also, if you want to study the low energy behavior, this is the way you have to study. Right? That, so as an example, suppose you are considering QED with electrons and muons. Okay. If you want to calculate, if you want to calculate a scattering of uh, electrons okay. and photon at an energy scale that is small compared to the mass of the muon, right? what you will do is that you will integrate out the muon. Right? The effective beta function that contributes. So what is the integrating of muons means? Uh, Meaning, they remove the muons from the uh, theory, yeah. right? And change the coupling a little bit to compensate for that. Okay? So, let me draw a figure, maybe. It will become clear. Let me try to. So, the way your g bar of lambda. With various lambda okay. is the following. Let's suppose, let's say we have infrared field theory. Okay, it's coming down like this. Okay. At some point, this lambda ki, okay, so ki is some fixed number, say, right? Lambda ki comes below the threshold of production of certain particle. Okay. So below this. You first of all have to change, make a change okay, in this coupling constant, which is a threshold correction. This is what I describe as threshold correction. And then evolve it differently, okay, which may either be faster or slower depending on what the beta function is. Yeah, but this beta function that you use to evolve is not the same as this beta function. This beta function is the one that you calculate without this particle. Okay. Then you reach another threshold. Okay. You again change a little bit. Maybe this time it's high. It goes up a little bit, the threshold correction. Then you start evolving from here, but with yet another beta function, right? Which may even make it up. Wow. Okay. Right? The theory may become. I mean, uh, asymptotically free instead of infrared free. So, during this evolution, right, if you don't do this, right, it's not that, I mean, if you include taller, I mean, higher corrections, it's not that you'll make a mis mistake. Right? After all, you have, you have choose to free to choose, keep all particles in your description, right? What will happen in that case is that the coupling constant may run according to the original beta function, right? No threshold coupling constant will run according to the original beta function. But, there will be terms like this log m over mu in the actual expression, right, on the right hand side of the RG equation, which will make the uh, uh, this formula uh, not very useful, right, because there are large terms in the formula which are not under control. Yeah, that you have to explicitly calculate this log m over mu terms, right, or log m, m over lambda terms, which can give large quantities. So by integrating out this, by using these special corrections and changing your beta function from the one with that particle to one without that particle, right, what you are ensuring is that you don't encounter these kinds of terms, right? Because these large mass terms have gone, right? Because they are not that, that particle is not even there in the part of the spectrum, right? So all calculations you do now is without that particle, right? So there is a question of getting any log of them. Yes. And then keep the log n by mu term. Yes. And then does it convert? Yes. Then if, I mean, if, if you can calculate all the log m over mu terms and keep everything, the result is the same because. So is, is it real effect or artifact log m by mu? No, it's real effect. It's real effect because, I mean, after all, if we don't use the mass, right? Then the coupling would have run in one way, right? Now you are using the original coupling. You you. Take the coupling to run like this, including everything, right? Which is okay, but there is something which should compensate for it, right? Because the final result for the S matrix cannot depend on how you do this calculation. But, but I also demand that when m is large, yes, the quantities that I calculate, I independently take up with this. Yes, but which means that external particles shouldn't include the particle that you are from decoupling, right? That is of course always as well. Because the external yes. particle masses should be small compared to the Let's say the internal particle is as heavy as this large. Yeah, exactly. Then I, I expect that I, ex I, I 
I I I I would like to see the dispersing effect from the Lagrangian without integrating it. You can do it. So what I'm saying is that result that you will get by using that particle in the loop. Eventually, you will agree with the result that you get by doing this calculation, right? Is that the there you will see this by a complicated cancellation between these various log m over u terms and the uh, RG running that you will do by this, right? So what I'm saying, if you continue to use the same RG running, so this will be compensated by some other. Exactly, this will be compensated by the fact that here you are changing the RG running and you don't have those log m over u terms. Okay, so that's it. So that's the problem. Yeah. So that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the motivation? I mean, after all, you are using RG to uh, get a simpler way to do calculations, right? If you have these large log terms, right, it's not simplifying anything because the right hand side has these large terms which are not under control, right? Which you have to actually calculate and see what it is. Okay. RG tells you how to avoid that problem, right? But to avoid these log m over mu, you have to make sure that anytime your energy scale comes below the part, a given particle mass. You just remove the particle from the spectrum okay. at the cost of including this threshold correction, which changes the coupling a little bit. But, uh, to calculate the threshold correction, one has to calculate actually not by loop diagrams but by uh, only three level diagrams, right? Like for the uh, in weak interaction case, so suppose electron position going to something else, so there is suppose W one W boson is there. So suppose we don't know the W boson, then we will int means by integrating of the propagator what one get the four frame interaction. Mm. So yes. uh, in that way one has to fix the threshold correction. Well, so uh, typically the okay, there are many ways to fix the threshold correction. Typically what you do is that you do this calculus in two different ways. Right? One is that you continue to use the original RG, okay, and use this use this log over you, but don't go too far. Go a little bit below the uh, particle mass scale. That's one way of doing this. The other way is that you assume that particle, that particle has gone, you have integrated, you leave this undetermined, okay, and then you compare some physical scattering between these two descriptions. Okay? If you calculate some physical scattering between these two descriptions, it will tell you how much you have to change it so that you get the same physical result by keeping the particle. So you just do the calculation by keeping the particle, you do the calculation by integrating out the particle and by comparing these two, you know the effective the relationship between the couplings in the original description and the coupling in the new description. So, then what is the actual like, uh, effective charge coupling, like one by the subtraction? One is? In the coupling in, in like four by one by the subtraction. Yes. Uh, that is the effective coupling given the Well, that effective coupling is best thing thought on terms of the composite operator. But okay, you, about what I'm talking about, the effective coupling here is not the higher dimensional couplings. Okay? Because at low energy, those higher dimensional couplings have gone anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'm thinking of the couplings, it's like integrating out of muons, mu right? So the QED coupling is running, right? You integrate out of muons, you still have the electrons and photons, right? But you now use the uh, evolution equation, the beta function without the muons. Right, that the way the QVD coupling will run below the muon threshold is without the muons. But if we just calculate the nice beta function that I described, which one loop beta function doesn't depend on the masses, right? So there you would conclude that even below the muon threshold, you'll continue to use the muons in the loop, right? Which is also one way of doing calculation, but that you will now get a term which involves the log of muon mass over the energy scale that you are working. No, you don't need the experimental input. I mean, it's a purely theoretical analysis that you do the theoretical analysis in two different ways. Right? One is that you take the particle that is propagating in the loop, don't integrate it out, okay? and calculate some uh, physical scattering losses. Okay? Then you take the uh, theory where the particle has been uh, integrated out, which means you remove the particle from the theory, like a muon, right? and again you calculate the physical scattering. Then we compare the two. Okay. That will tell you how the couplings in the original one should be related to the couplings in the new description. Okay. And that's what that's how one of the determine this special correction. But when you, if the mean uh, where the 
फेसबुक कैपिशन काम वन ऑफ द मार्क्स ऑफ द वैल्यू सो इफ द टू साइड्स वन ऑफ दिस इज एसिमटोटिकली फ्री एंड अदर वन इज एसिमटोटिकली मीन्स आई आर फ्री देन कैलकुलेटिंग दिस टू कोरिलेशन फंक्शन जस्ट अबाउट दिस एनर्जी एंड दिस one cannot determine what is the coupling constant there yeah so the point this is of course approximate yeah. if you want the full theory right you have to do the full calculation here yeah, the question right is there a value go far below right which point you should start here right here you are going like this if you go far below by this can you have gone here right and what are asking is that now if you have gone here how to come there right that what is the best value that you can put here Right? So that you get the correct description of it, right? But if you actually want to calculate the scattering in this region, right, to arbitrary accuracy, then of course you have to include the full loop calculation, right? Then you cannot get it just by using simple arguments. Suppose you are going in the reverse loop. Yes. Yes. Some part is in some some high lambda, some part is. Yeah. Well, it's exactly the same opposite, right? You have to put those that particle in in the running, right? Yeah, and then you may wonder that suppose you put that particle in, right? Then you may wonder that that particle is there, right? So how come you got the right result earlier without that particle in? Right? <laughs> Because after all, the, if you take the particle in, right, in your theory, and you use the use the formula for the beta function that I uh, gave. What you are calculating earlier is basically the. Exactly. And then the particle comes in, and then how the theory actual theory what you don't know. Exactly. So for every time a new particle comes in, you put it in the beta function, right? And you then you have to state for what is the corrected g bar, and then exactly. So you have you have to see what is the corrected g bar, what is the relationship between the g bar that you are evolving from below and what will come above, and then you keep evolving upward. See, and this in fact. Maybe I just um, say it and then I end. So if you do this thing for the standard model, right? There are there are three couplings, right? We have the U one, S U two, and S U three. Okay, above the weak interaction threshold, which is above M W, all these particles are effectively massless, so all of them should contribute to the beta function, right? All the particles that you have listed in the standard model. To start contributing the beta function, and you can ask how do these couplings come? Right, so you start from somewhere like hundred degrees, okay, or maybe three hundred degrees, and start running them upward. Okay? And what one finds is that effectively these couplings, in this case, if you go far, very far. Then approximately all the three couplings come together at some scale of the order of 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 degrees. Okay, and this is what you get. So this basically was one of the evidence okay, which suggested that perhaps there is a unifying gauge group okay, at this scale, say SU5. Okay, SU5 can contain SU3, SU2, and U1. Okay, the other unified gauge groups like. Okay, so ten and so on. Okay. So the idea is that perhaps there is some unifying gauge group which is broken at this scale. Okay. After it is broken at this scale, okay. then each coupling is run independently because you basically throw away all the gauge bosons which are there, which have become massive when this symmetry got broken. SU five, of course, has many more gauge bosons than SU three, SU two, and U one. Okay. So all those gauge bosons have become massive, and that's why you see this different running of the coupling. But above this, okay, if there is really unifying gauge group, then all these couplings, after the taking into account the threshold, it just runs together. Okay, because there is SU five, there is only one coupling in SU five, and that's what will the beta function of SU five will run. Whether this is true or not, we still don't know. Right? So, I mean, if, if it is true, I mean, it turns out that when one does get the calculation a little more. Sensitively, okay. That the usual standard model that I wrote down, or that it doesn't really quite work, right? The couplings don't quite fit at the at one point. But there is a super symmetric version of the standard model, okay, for which the couplings do meet at one point. Okay, so that's taken as a suggestion that perhaps super symmetric version of the standard model is the right theory, and that becomes part of the unified gauge group.
Yes, it is defined because if they are genuinely massive, massless particles, right, then you cannot remove it by tadpoles and mass normalization, right. Those are uh, uh, simple kind of IR divergences, but these IR divergences are not uh, removable by that, right. It reflects the fact that in the presence of massless particles, you cannot really talk about a single particle. See, the physics of this is the following. Then suppose there are genuinely massless particles, right, then when you produce a certain final state, how do you distinguish that from a very low energy massless particle coming with it? Okay? Because by any finite amount of measurement, you cannot distinguish say a single electron from an electron with uh, some very, very low energy photon accompanying it. Okay? So that's the reason why you have to sum over final states to get a uh, sensible answer. Right? Then you don't worry about whether you are only producing electrons. Right? You worry about what you are producing as a whole. Yeah, electrons together with some low energy photons. So this is different from tadpole cancellation and mass normalization.